Many people think that Lenovo's radical design changes to the beloved ThinkPad lineup started with the X1 Nano, or the T490, or the revival of the Z series this year. However, the foundation for modern ThinkPad design can be traced back to one laptop that was released a decade ago, the X1 Carbon. This was not Lenovo's first attempt at an Ultrabook or an ultra-portable laptop, as the original Carbon was a follow-up to a previous model simply called the X1, which itself, at least in my eyes, was an indirect successor to the X300 and X301 models released in the late 2000s. Even before that, Lenovo inherited the 12-inch X series of ultra-portable laptops from IBM when they took over the ThinkPad line which at the time were considered to be the premium thin and light products similar to what the X1 series is marketed as today. Controversial to some and a big step forward to others, I felt that for the laptop's 10th anniversary it would be worthwhile to take a look back at what I would consider to be Lenovo's first true Ultrabook. As with most Ultrabooks, the X1 Carbon has a very streamlined and simple appearance. It still embraces the typical ThinkPad design with an almost all-black casing, a rubberized outer coating, and a soft-touch finish on the palm rest. The design is still a major departure from the traditional ThinkPad design. For example, the display hinges have been sunken into the chassis, the keyboard is embedded into the top palm rest instead of being a separate component, and a more tapered design with thinner display bezels is used compared to the more chunky, blocky design that other ThinkPads had. The outer coating and the smooth keyboard are fingerprint magnets, so it's a smart idea to keep your hands clean and maybe have a microfiber cloth handy. The carbon fiber magnesium alloy chassis feels very sturdy and I didn't notice any flexing or creaking in my use of the machine. There's nothing particularly noteworthy about the outside of the laptop save for a few indicator lights on the top and four rubber feet on the bottom. There is no docking port on this model which is unusual for a ThinkPad of the time period. On each side are the handful of ports that the machine has, including the power input, ventilation, an always-on USB 2.0 port, and a physical switch to turn the wireless on and off. Moving to the other side, there is a Kensington lock, a USB 3.0 port, a mini display port, a headphone microphone combo jack, and a full sized SD card reader. The X1 Carbon departs from tradition and uses a rectangular power connector instead of the then standard barrel type connector. The so called slim tip port became standard for future ThinkPads until the advent of USB Type C charging. However, a handful of Lenovo's workstation models continue to use this connector. Notably lacking is any sort of wired Ethernet connection, and the lack of support for a docking station limits your expansion options. In 2012, this would have been a fairly lackluster port selection, and even by today's standards, it's a limited number of ports. But for most of my uses, having USB and headphone support as well as a full-sized SD card slot is good enough. After using the X1 Nano and needing to have a dongle of some sort with me at all times, it was refreshing to be able to do everything I needed without carrying extra clutter around. Opening the laptop, there's a 14-inch display, a 720p webcam as well as a microphone array, a fingerprint reader for secure login, a power button with a built-in LED, and the usual keyboard, track point, and touchpad ThinkPads are known for. As with other Ivy Bridge ThinkPads, the X1 Carbon uses the island-style chiclet keyboard that previously appeared on the original X1 in 2011. While I prefer the original 7-row layout and modified my T430 to accept the classic keyboard, the X1 Carbon's keyboard feels nice to type on. It has a good amount of key travel and is decently springy. The keys don't bottom out when I'm typing, and the backlight offers better visibility in low light. As with all ThinkPads, the track point sits between the G, H, and B keys, and functions exactly as one would expect. In addition to the dedicated track point buttons, there is a reasonably sized touchpad that tracks well and supports a handful of multi-touch gestures. The touchpad has a smooth glass surface similar to what MacBooks have, instead of that weird basketball-like texture that other ThinkPads at the time were using. Another feature of the X1 Carbon's input devices that I really appreciate are the dedicated volume buttons, which were standard on ThinkPads from the early 2000s until the Haswell generation. Why Lenovo did away with dedicated volume buttons I will never understand. There is also remnants of Lenovo's ThinkVantage feature, which was being phased out right as the X1 Carbon entered production, hence why there's a blank button next to the volume controls. Additionally, there are indicator lights for wireless and drive activity embedded into the top of the keyboard area, another feature from the days of yesteryear that has unfortunately been removed from newer ThinkPads. There are also indicator lights on the display assembly and where the power adapter plugs in. The first generation X1 Carbon comes with either a third generation Core i5 or i7 U-series processor. Compared to the mobile processors used in other laptops at the time, U-series chips are designed to use less power and conserve battery life while running cooler. 
which allows for a thinner and lighter laptop than what was previously normal. My model has a Core i5-3427U processor clocked at 1.8GHz, with support for Intel Turbo Boost up to 2.8GHz. The laptop is configured with 4 or 8GB of RAM, which is soldered onto the motherboard. My configuration is the higher-end one with 8GB. All X1 Carbon ship with an SSD and do not support standard hard drives. The X1 Carbon uses a 14-inch 1600x900 display, rated for roughly 300 nits of brightness. While this is a TN panel which may draw disapproval from some people, I will admit this is one of the better displays I have seen on a ThinkPad from this time period. The colors are more vibrant, the contrast is better, and viewing angles are a little bit wider. While this screen doesn't hold a candle compared to a decent IPS display, it is more than good enough for most people's needs. In fact, some people have adapted the X1 Carbon's display to work in the T430 or T430S for its improvements over those laptop stock panels. One thing to note about the screen is that it uses PWM for dimming, which can cause some people to notice flickering, especially at lower brightness levels. This isn't something I notice or really care about, but I know it can be a deal breaker for some. Considering that the ThinkPad lineup is primarily geared towards business users, and also given that this is a 10-year-old Ultrabook, you can expect it to be a graphics powerhouse. The Intel HD Graphics 4000 performance is on par with just about any other laptop from that generation. It's good enough for basic tasks and light video work, but it won't be able to replace a desktop or any machine with dedicated graphics. Older and lightweight games play fine on the X1 Carbon, even at full resolution. The speakers on the X1 Carbon aren't particularly high fidelity by any means, additionally they are downwards firing which some people don't like, but they get the job done and they can get decently loud. For more generalized tasks, the X1 Carbon can still get the job done. Modern operating systems like Windows 10 run fine with minimal slowdowns, and for those that want to make the most out of older hardware, Linux can be installed and runs just as it should out of the box. Newer websites notorious for being bloated and poorly optimized load just fine. While newer laptops have made substantial gains in speed and power efficiency, this machine still feels relatively snappy and modern. I could play full HD 60 frame per second videos off my camcorder without any problems, and additionally YouTube videos at the same resolution and frame rate worked without any buffering. With a low power Ultrabook CPU, the X1 Carbon manages to achieve better battery life than what most laptops at the time period could do. While not as good as what modern laptops are capable of under good circumstances, the battery life on this thing is good enough for getting some work done on the go. The 46 watt hour battery is rated for around 8 hours of battery life by Lenovo. My battery is a little on the older side and it doesn't hold the same capacity it could when it was new. Despite that, I can still get a few hours of use out of it. If I put in a high quality replacement battery, I'm sure I'd be getting closer to the original estimated life that this battery is rated for. While the X1 Carbon lacks the external batteries that other ThinkPads at the time had, or the PowerBridge hot swappable battery system utilized by newer models, replacing the internal battery is fairly straightforward. After removing a few screws and the keyboard assembly, it's right there. In traditional ThinkPad fashion, many of the internal components are easily accessible and can be replaced with relative ease. Like with all ThinkPads, Lenovo has service manuals available on their website, as well as the necessary information to get replacement parts. The keyboard, touchpad, fingerprint reader, ports, the display, the power jack, the cooling assembly, and the SSD are all user replaceable to some extent. RAM is unfortunately soldered on, and it's probably the biggest bottleneck for this machine when it comes to upgrades, but this is just a fact of life with thinner laptops. The entire X1 lineup, aside from the original 2011 model and the Extreme series, all have soldered RAM. While the SSD is technically a replaceable component, it is not easy due to Lenovo's choice to use a non-standard 20 plus 6 pin form factor. The original SSDs for these machines are hard to find and expensive, so the best way to upgrade or replace the storage in these machines is to use a cheap adapter that allows you to use more standard SATA-based M.2 drives. The original X1 Carbon does not support NVMe SSDs. Lenovo realized that using a non-standard format was a mistake, and has used standard M.2 drives for subsequent models but it's a royal pain to deal with on the 2012 X1 Carbon, and in my opinion is one of the biggest drawbacks of this laptop. Additionally, if using an adapter and an aftermarket SSD, you have to be careful about its physical size. If the drive takes up too much space, it can push up on the palm rest and keyboard. So what exactly is the verdict on one of Lenovo's first Ultrabooks? 
It's definitely not my favorite for multiple reasons. If I'm going to use a ThinkPad this old, I'd rather use a model like the T430 or X230 that I can swap the classic keyboard into and that has some degree of upgradability. The display, while not horrendous, is dwarfed by more modern offerings, and things like the lackluster port selection and decade-old low-power processor date this machine more than some of its other counterparts. Despite that, the model still has it where it counts. From a design standpoint, it still feels like a timeless ThinkPad, while looking fairly modern and streamlined, and it has useful features like indicator LEDs and dedicated volume buttons. Weighing it at only 3 pounds, it feels lightweight even by today's standards, and as a matter of fact, is only a half pound heavier than Lenovo's current X1 Carbon. There's no weak points or noticeable chassis flex, and the laptop feels quite sturdy. The X1 Carbon isn't meant for everyone. It never was. Performance enthusiasts and anyone who likes tinkering with their device should look elsewhere, but if you don't have any intense demands or just want a good spare laptop, this is worth looking into. You won't be playing AAA titles on the X1 Carbon or producing the next blockbuster movie, but for browsing the web and doing some basic office work, it more than gets the job done. They're rather affordable on the used market, and spare parts are easy to come by. This first-generation model paved the way for all newer ThinkPads to follow, for better or for worse, and it was interesting to take a look back and use this machine. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and as always, thanks for watching.